Beijing subway suddenly breaks apart during operation, over 30 people injured. Beijing gives heavy prison sentences to P2P lending billionaires. Another target to blame? U.S. House Committee plans legislation to revoke China's most favored nation status. It's all covered in today's China Truths. Beijing subway suddenly breaks apart during operation, over 30 people injured. A sudden accident wreaked havoc on Beijing's Chongping Line subway, causing a train to unexpectedly split in half during operation. The incident occurred during the evening rush hour on the 14th, resulting in injuries for over 30 passengers. Netizens shared videos capturing the chaotic moment when a Beijing subway train on the Changping Line abruptly separated into two sections, with a separation of more than 10 meters on the ground. Passenger Mr. Zhou described to mainland media the abrupt and sharp break, accompanied by a loud bang from the back of the train, leading to a shattered side window. The scene inside the subway was extremely chaotic, with people collectively falling, and cries echoing within the car. The accident resulted in injuries for over 30 passengers, with reports of fractures and swollen faces emerging. Passengers were seen exiting through open doors, and some individuals could be observed on the track searching for items. The incident unfolded on December 14, a day marked by moderate to heavy snowfall in Beijing. The train disconnect occurred around 7 p.m., aggravating the situation during the evening rush hour. Following the incident, both the official Beijing subway Weibo account and all mainland media outlets asserted that the Beijing subway experienced a sudden malfunction. Contrary to these statements, a report from the Asia Television News website disclosed that, in the outbound direction from Beijing, specifically between Zierki and Life Science Park stations, a collision took place involving trains on the Changping Line. This collision resulted in the separation of the train couplings. Photos circulating online depicted the CP024 train being struck from behind by another train, leading to the detachment of one end of the carriage in the fourth compartment of the CP024 train. Over a hundred workers in Dongwan protest on factory rooftop for four days and four nights. A surge in social discontent in China has triggered protests, notably by nearly a hundred employees of Ruilita Glass Cover Plate Technology Company, Limited, in Dongwan City, Guangdong Province, protesting consistently for four days and four nights. On December 14, a video posted on YouTube by the channel yesterday revealed that around a hundred workers in Dongwan City initiated a collective protest on December 11. They gathered on the rooftop of an eight story factory building urging the company for fair compensation. The workers distributed flyers, resembling falling snowflakes, and one employee shouted, Jump off! Ruilita Glass Cover Plate Technology Company, Limited, recently relocated its factory equipment to Guizhou without compensating its workers. Instead, the company implemented measures such as halting social security payments, blocking signals, installing surveillance cameras, and cutting off power and water supplies pressuring employees into involuntary resignations. The workers, in this rights protection movement, expressed determination for a fair resolution. As of the 14th, this action endured for four days and four nights. Government officials and police pledged to address the workers' demands, yet no substantial resolution has materialized. Dongwan Ruilita Glass Cover Plate Technology Company, Limited, a subsidiary of Rueda International Group, established in 2011, is a high-tech enterprise with clientele including Samsung, LG, Xiaomi, Lenovo, Huawei, BBK, BYD, and Meizu. In the context of a severe economic downturn on the mainland, businesses face a crisis, resulting in frequent wage arrears and mass layoffs, leading to consecutive protests. Additionally, ongoing stability efforts and rigorous scrutiny by Chinese authorities mean that only a fraction of incidents makes it onto the Internet. According to a report by Voice of America on August 28, China dissent monitor by Freedom House recorded 2,803 instances of dissent, both offline and online, in China during H1 2023, with over 30,000 participants. Labor disputes in China surged since December, with at least 93 offline labor rights protests in June, 
a 2.35-fold increase from last year. The ongoing indiscriminate suppression of protests by the CCP indicates a profound insecurity in governance. Beijing gives heavy prison sentences to P2P lending billionaires, another target to blame? Chinese billionaires linked to peer-to-peer, P2P, lending platforms face life sentences over alleged billion-dollar illegal financing schemes. However, analysts suspect the CCP is blaming P2P lenders for plundering citizens' savings, raising concerns that seized funds may benefit Beijing rather than compensating victims. Chinese authorities began advocating P2P lending platforms in 2013, with multiple state-owned media reporting that this online loan platform could help ease financing challenges and meet the demand for private capital investment. In 2015, then-Premier Li Keqiang endorsed internet finance, providing high-level support for P2P during his visit to Shenzhen with several ministries and commissions. Official publications gave credibility to the P2P lending platforms, which then attracted large amounts of investment from private individuals. As of 2018, the scale of China's P2P industry reached 1.3 trillion yuan, about $184 billion, with 50 million registered users. According to Chinese state media, there were 1,836 online lending platforms across the country at that time. However, since 2018, the P2P industry has been snared in scandals and default crises. Beijing began to purge the sector, reducing the number of P2P online lending platforms from a peak of around 5,000 to zero by the end of 2020. Mr. Tang Jingyuan, a U.S.-based current affairs commentator, said that the about turn on P2P lenders was a slap to its face, given that they were grown with the backing of Beijing or had links to corruption cases involving Chinese senior officials. Mr. Tang believes that the risk control measures implemented by P2P platforms, such as bank deposits and the IC Agile Certified Professional, ICP, an industry-recognized credential, are ineffective in protecting investors' interests when operators misappropriated or absconded with large sums of money, this can be partly attributed to a dereliction of duty by the CCP regulators. He emphasizes that the collapse of Chinese P2P platforms is rooted in systemic issues within the communist regime, fostering collusion between those in power and wealthy owners, eroding people's trust. Several P2P operators jailed for life. Zhou Shiping, recognized as the godfather of Chinese online lending, was sentenced to life imprisonment on December 7, along with 17 accomplices, for fraudulent financing. The 55-year-old established Hongling Capital in 2009, attracting around 109 billion yuan, approximately $15.3 billion, from over 480,000 private investors. Lin Wenfeng, the founder of Shenzhen Wenshenwai Investment Company and Shenzhen Gongxining Financial Information Service Company, also received a life sentence for illegal financing and fraud. Lin and his 11 accomplices were convicted of collecting public deposits of 38.6 billion yuan, about $5.38 billion, through P2P loans and private lending. Lin has held leadership positions in the Industrial and Commercial Bank of China, the Export-Import Bank of China, and the China Merchants Bank. He was once the president of Hong Kong Satellite Television and the chairman of the Shenzhen Golf Club. He Yuan, known for his red financial products in Shanghai, received a life sentence on November 14 for deceptive selling through his companies, including Humsen, Shanghai, investment management company, drawing over 8.9 billion yuan, about $1.25 billion, from more than 41,100 investors. The Guangdong Provincial High Court upheld the original verdict on November 3, sentencing Peng Tai, CEO of Neo Capital Management Group, to life imprisonment and confiscation of all personal property. The case involved illegal financing and fraud worth 102.6 billion yuan, about $14.3 billion, through P2P loans and private financial products. The Guangdong authorities arrested Peng Tai and colleagues in January 2021, freezing accounts and confiscating 1,056 properties. Neo Capital Management Group, one of Guangdong's largest P2P platforms, had over 6 million registrants and branches in 150 cities, 
extending its business even to the NBA's Maverick basketball team. Victim's Loss and Beijing's Guilt Although the Chinese court has heavily punished online lenders and confiscated their assets, the victims don't seem to be recouping their funds. Chinese lawyers indicated that in such cases of illegal financing schemes, if the money cannot be refunded by the end of the case, victims are not protected and must shoulder the loss themselves. Liu Yanlin, a pseudonym, a financial specialist in China, told NTD Television that the CCP previously promoted P2P platforms and facilitated the packaging and sale of bad loans to P2P platforms. Then, the CCP government tacitly allowed the P2P platforms to package these non-performing loans and sell them to uninformed small investors. The investment funds, raised by the platforms, eventually went to the banks, and the financial crisis was passed on to the Chinese people. Mr. Tang Jingyuan said, to put all the blame on the heads of the online lending platforms is more politically motivated than economically meaningful as the CCP cannot find a way out of the economic crisis. U.S. House Committee Plans Legislation to Revoke China's Most Favored Nation Status It appears that the U.S. government is becoming more assertive towards the CCP. After the statement by United States Secretary of Commerce Gina Raimondo that China's not our friend, the latest development from the U.S. House of Representatives plans legislation to revoke China's most favored nation status. In more detail, the U.S. House of Representatives Special Committee on U.S.-China Strategic Competition issued a report on December 12, proposing an increased disconnection of economic and financial ties between the U.S. and China. This includes the suggestion to revoke the preferential tariff treatment granted to China. The extensive 53-page report encompasses nearly 150 legislative policy recommendations, addressing a broad spectrum of issues. Its objective is to fundamentally transform the trade, investment, and business interaction models between the two major economies. The report outlines three main pillars of legislative suggestions, first, resetting economic relations with China, second, restricting the flow of U.S. capital and technology into China to curb its military modernization and human rights violations, and third, investing in technological leadership while collectively establishing economic resilience with allies. The report highlights that the U.S. has acknowledged that granting China permanent normal trade relations, PNTR, did not yield benefits for U.S.-China trade relations and did not witness the expected structural reforms in China. Instead, it diminished the crucial economic influence that the U.S. held in bilateral relations. Professor Xie Tian from the Moore School of Business at the University of South Carolina emphasized, the most impactful part is the first system, which involves resetting the terms of economic relations with China. This includes revoking the most favored nation treatment for China, lowering the minimum threshold for duty-free goods, and formulating economic and financial emergency plans to address conflicts with China in advance. This unprecedented move signals a significant shift in the U.S.'s economic relationship with China, representing the strongest measures to essentially sever economic ties. The report also highlights the absence of emergency plans in the United States to address escalating conflicts, emphasizing the need to reevaluate the economic engagement policy between the United States and China. The report suggests adopting new measures to counter China's economic aggression in response to this evolving competition. Taiwanese economic expert Huang Shirtsong expressed, the Chinese Communist Party will undoubtedly be attentive to the practical implementation of this report. Nonetheless, it introduces an additional layer of complexity to China's economy. However, I view this as a predetermined policy for the United States. Should the U.S. persist in this direction, nations with robust economic ties to China are likely to face significant repercussions. This report garnered overwhelming bipartisan support. Analysts propose that while some contentious recommendations may not be embraced, the report acts as a roadmap for future legislative initiatives in Congress pertaining to China-related matters. Xie Tian stated, essentially, this mirrors U.S. public sentiment. Public opinion will be a focal point in the upcoming presidential debates, commencing with the primaries in January. Topics related to China, the Chinese Communist Party, and those addressed in this bill will feature prominently in various discussions during the election campaign.
leaders of the committee from both political parties assert that this report will serve as a blueprint for shaping next year's congressional policies regarding economic and trade relations with China. The committee explicitly states that challenges posed by the CCP have spurred bipartisan cooperation, with each senator expressing concern about CCP actions. Don't forget to leave a comment in the section below to share your opinions on today's topic with us. Make sure to like and subscribe to see more interesting topics from China Truths.